is weird, odd, strange, or just plain bizarre is really your cup of tea. Then, the Golden State Media Concepts Weird News Podcast will give you that fix. Can't believe it? Well, listen for yourself as we deliver the strangest news you definitely won't find on CNN or Fox. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Weird News Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Weird News Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Clutch Caleb, and today we will be talking all about crimes for about the first half of the show, which involves 200 half-naked inmates escaping a jail in Uganda, as well as a man who fell asleep while committing theft. That one sounds like a classic. There's also one about a man who fled a police traffic stop, leaving behind his winning lottery ticket. And about a half dozen more crime stories. Then we'll get into the basic weird news stories, including a space travel reality show, which is set to send contestants to the International Space Station in 2023. Quite bizarre. And speaking of bizarre, we will wrap up with the fifth grader who was kicked out of class because his face mask had hooters all over it. (laughs) So we'll get an explanation for that, and then we will wrap up with my top 10 got dang unsolved mysteries. This one's been a long time coming, but we will cover it today. But for now, we're going to jump into our crime stories with more than 200 half-naked inmates escaping a jail in Uganda. Of course, Uganda's military and security forces have since been pursuing the group of 210 inmates. This all began with a jailbreak, and once all the prisoners escaped the prison... They stripped down half-naked to avoid being identified as prisoners. They took off all their prison clothes. Since the escape, three of the escapees from the prison have been killed and seven have been detained. A senior military officer who was also killed in an exchange of fire at the prison in the foothills of Mount Morodo on Wednesday afternoon is just one of the lives that is likely to be endangered after all these escapees. The prisoners made their escape after breaking into an armory at the prison where 620 people were being held and taking the guns and ammunition before overpowering the prison warden. Quote, the army is in pursuit. According to Brig Flavia, the spokeswoman for the Uganda People's Defense Force, quote, they remove all their uniforms because the yellow color was giving them away. These are warriors. They are used to the bush. They know how to run. They know the area and terrain very well. (laughs) They know the bush. Frank Bain, a prisoner's service spokesman, described the jailbreak as one of the rarest cases of its kind. Among the escapees were prisoners considered dangerous and jailed for involvement in deadly armed cattle raids across Karamoja, which we covered in a previous episode. Apparently, these people just go from farm to farm, stealing cattle and selling them back to other farmers they stole cattle from. The prison service spokesman goes on to say, quote, The pursuit is going on, but of course those are warriors on their home ground. They know all the tactics about the army. Scattering, hiding, stripping, and the like. <laughs> I like how uh, stripping is traditional on these prisoners' home ground. Quote, the moment they got out of the prison, they ran into different directions, but most of them were heading for Mount Moroto, where it is almost a no-man's land and they can move without being intercepted. The incident in Uganda is the third prisoner escape since the coronavirus outbreak began last March. In other cases, fears of contracting the virus in camped jails spurred inmates, as well as their efforts to break out. And at least three cases of the coronavirus have been reported in Ugandan jails. It's unclear how many are actually infected, as the testing resources have not been delegated to the prisoners themselves and rather the people of Uganda. The total number of inmates in Uganda rose about 10% to 65,000 in the five months between March and August, according to the prison's service. A surge attributed to a large number of people apprehended for violations of various anti-coronavirus measures, such as curfews and travel restrictions. That is miserable. 
going to prison for breaking a curfew. The prison spokeswoman said a helicopter was, quote, waiting to be called in to a fire when it was called back to tame the prisoners. If necessary, the same helicopter will be called to fire upon the prisoners. The army is doing what it can and its best to make sure these people are all arrested, and we are sure we shall. There you go. As previously stated, they only found 10 people, or around 5% of the inmates that escaped. So we'll have to wait and see how that turns out. Anchorage dentist who defrauded Medicaid and extracted patient tooth while riding a hoverboard is sentenced to prison. So this Alaskan dentist was film riding a hoverboard, which is like a Segway without handlebars, basically. He was filmed riding a hoverboard during a procedure on a patient who was under anesthesia. And since that video came out, he's been convicted on 46 counts of defrauding the federal Medicaid program. And he has since been sentenced to 12 years in prison. Good God. The Anchorage Superior Court Judge Michael Wolverton found the man guilty of pressuring patients to needlessly undergo interventions in order to promote sedation all in an effort to bill Medicaid for the service and make more money for himself. The judge on Monday suspended eight years of the sentence, leaving the dentist with 12 years of prison time to serve. The state requested the dentist to pay more than $2 million in restitution for the Medicaid fraud. I don't know how much dentists make, but I imagine that $2 million is going to be a lot either way. A 25-second video can be found online that appears to have been filmed on the dentist's assistant's phone, which shows him riding a hoverboard into an exam room before removing a tooth from a sedated patient and then pivoting and riding away comically. I, of course, find this funny in my sadistic type of humor, but if I was under the knife and I haven't been asked about this before, I imagine I would be upset as a patient. <laughs> Evidence presented at the trial showed other patients were left unattended while sedated, and had breathing and heart complications as a result, some of which nearly died. Patients also went on to testify that they woke from anesthesia to discover the man working or removing the wrong teeth and often straying from the agreed treatment plans. The judge said that he was particularly surprised by the numerous text messages in which the dentist brags to his friends about his crimes, quote, I've never seen anything like it, not ever. <laughs> the dentist apologized in court while reading a prepared statement. Quote, while I do not doubt that I was able to render care and alleviate the pain to many people who were in dire need, I also know that I could have and should have maintained better discipline and focus while serving a patient base I came to love. <laughs> And thus begins his 12-year sentence. All right, this next story, although it's crime-related, I love it a whole bunch. The Cow Yai National Park litterers will get their trash back to them in the mail. <laughs> Quote, we purposefully collected all your rubbish in a box and sent them to your home as a souvenir, as a lesson not to litter anywhere ever again. This is just brilliant. So, so much trash was left at the Cow Yai National Park composite that uh, park officials have packed it in parcel boxes and sent it back to the campers. The Minister of National Resources and Environment ordered park officials to pack up the rubbish and send the parcel to the tourists' addresses that were recorded in the National Park Bureau's reservation system. The people who visited the park last weekend in particular left a large amount of trash and food waste by their campsites. The minister says that the people did not utilize the garbage bins that are provided at the park. Not only will the tourists get a box of their own trash in the mail, but littering will also be reported to the local police for violating the National Park Act. Quote, the authorities have facilitated visitors with everything we could have thought of. They only had to come here and enjoy beautiful nature, but we never thought that they would leave us with such waste. He then took his outrage to Facebook, where he posted an outline of two sections in the National Park Act. He says acts that damage the natural resources or ecosystem face up to five years in prison and a fine of 500,000 baht, which is about 16,000 U.S. dollars. 
Another section he cited says that those who violate park rules face a fine up to 100,000 baht or 3,000 US dollars. The minister says that it is important to dispose all of the waste properly, adding that even just a small piece of trash can be extremely harmful if an animal swallows it. Quote, We kindly ask every tourist to put garbage in the provided areas because the garbage that you left may kill wild animals and come down around the area looking for food. In this case, we purposefully collected all your rubbish in a box and then sent to your home as a souvenir, as a lesson to not litter anywhere ever again. I personally hope that uh, the United States kind of takes this as an example of how to handle situations. But if we don't, I wouldn't be too surprised. Next story, a man discovers a brain washed ashore on the beach. (laughs) It's said that the man went to the beach to find some peace of thought, but he got quite the opposite when he discovered what seemed to be a brain that had washed ashore. Native authorities are attempting to determine who or what the brain came from. Quote, it didn't register as a human brain. I was just like, what is this? <laughs> According to the 47-year-old who found the brain, he went on to mention that he regularly searches close by the seashores for gadgets equivalent to sea glass in order to include in his sculptures because he is an artist. Way to go, man. Way to plug yourself in a news report. My guess is he was the one who put the brain there. <laughs> But hey, marketing is a brutal business. So, he was understandably intrigued after coming upon a package deal wrapped in aluminum foil fixed by a pink rubber band, whereas he found the brain, quote, curiosity got to me, so I popped it open and looked at it, and it appeared to be a chicken breast. (laughs) He goes on to say, it took a little bit for it to really register what was going on. It was a brain. Also with the parcel have been flowers and Chinese money. (laughs) The man said he was so flabbergasted by the weird discovery that he requested some close-by Metropolis workers for a second opinion. Quote, they're like, yeah, that's a brain. (laughs) And of course, as all excellent stories go, this got a lot of traction on social media. On Facebook, it sort of blew up. One comment said, quote, just when you thought 2020 couldn't get more effed up. Another one said, what kind of ritual were they trying to do? But of course, more importantly, are the internet skeptics, many of which are saying that it's a pig brain due to its size. Another one who scoffed, quote, yeah, why wouldn't you say what the police said? It's obviously not a full-grown human brain. Now the tests have come back, and it turns out the internet skeptics were right, as they always are. This was not a human brain. It is, in fact, undetermined, but not a human one. All right, next story. A burglar falls asleep in an AC room while committing theft, and he wakes up as the cops are arresting him. So this 21-year-old man who attempted to rob a house fell asleep under the bed of the owner in the middle of the night and eventually was arrested before he woke up. It is said that the man carefully observed the daily whereabouts of the house before he robbed it. And apparently he knew exactly where the man kept his money, where he fell asleep, as well as what hours he went to work. So at 4 a.m. he entered the unlocked house and stepped inside the bedroom where the owner of the house was fast asleep. And where is the brilliant hiding space for the money of the man who owned the house? Why, it's on his bedside table. (laughs) So the robber walked up to his bedside table and grabbed some cash. However, while unable to resist the temptation of a cool room, the exhausted burglar curled up under the man's bed and dozed off for several hours. The man who owns the house said that he woke up to hear snoring, and so he quickly tiptoed out of his room and called the cops. Once the police stormed inside the room, the burglar freaked out. Quote, he told us that he was tired, and since the air conditioner was also on, he couldn't resist the sleep. <laughs> And although he failed to commit the crime, he is being arrested for attempting to steal. Sad, sad, so sad. Stay tuned to the next segment where we will continue talking about crime-related weird news stories, including a man who fled a police traffic stop, leaving behind his winning lottery ticket. Stay tuned for that and more. 
Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the JSMC Weird News Podcast. We're going to do more crime-related weird news stories. Starting off with the man who fled a police traffic stop, leaving behind his winning lottery ticket. This occurred in a traffic stop in Georgia. The Cherokee County Sheriff's Office said deputies were on Interstate 75 last Monday when they spotted a car with a tag violation. They pulled it over because the man in the passenger seat fled into the nearby woods and dropped a backpack. Quote, inside that backpack was a laptop, a small amount of methamphetamine, and a winning lottery ticket, the amount of which they are not allowed to disclose. In a Facebook post, the Sheriff's Department congratulated the suspect for winning the lottery ticket, and they even invited him to come and claim it, which would have made the thing much funnier if he did. But unfortunately, he did not, as he would end up in Cherokee County Jail. Quote, to the suspect who ran out on foot from our deputies on a traffic stop this morning on I-75, you left a winning $100 lottery ticket in your vehicle. You can claim your lottery ticket at 498 Shatton Drive in Canton. It will be here waiting for you. Congratulations, by the way. (laughs) Shortly afterward, deputies took the man into custody and he was charged with possession of methamphetamine and obstruction. Quote, when he bonds out of jail or gets done with these charges, we'll certainly return that lottery ticket, but we're keeping the methamphetamine. Silly cops, the $100 can buy them even more meth. Okay, next story. (laughs) A man uses a live snake as a face mask while boarding a bus in England. The unidentified man was taking the bus from Swinton to Manchester last Monday with the snake wrapped around his neck when another passenger snapped a photo of the bizarre moment. Of course, you can go online and take a look at these photos but I can assure you it looks just like a man with a snake wrapped around his mouth and nose. A passenger who wished to remain anonymous said she first believed the man was only wearing a, quote, funky mask until the reptile started slithering over the handrails. (laughs) Yeah, that's at least unorthodox, I'd say. And the woman thought so too. She said that she found the incident, quote, really funny and the other passengers didn't seem bothered by the serpent. Quote, no one batted an eyelid. However, authorities said that the snake is not proper face covering during the COVID-19 pandemic. (laughs) I love it when people take something ridiculous seriously. Quote, Government guidance clearly states that this needn't be a surgical mask and that passengers can make their own or wear something suitable such as a scarf or bandana. However, this snake is not a proper face covering during the COVID-19 pandemic. They go on to say, quote, Well, there is a small degree of interpretation that can be implied to this. We do not believe it extends to the use of a snake skin, especially when it's still attached to a snake. <laughs> At least they have a bit of humor about them. In England, face masks are required on public transportation, such as planes, trains, and other automobiles, in an attempt to curb the spread of coronavirus. The man using a snake is still unidentified. But to losers like me, he will still be a hero. Next story, Americans will spend $60 billion on illegal marijuana this year. (laughs) So a study estimates that between 12 and 14% of adult Americans enjoy weed. That's a massive group of consumers, according to the industry experts. And apparently they spend billions of dollars every year on marijuana. Unfortunately, however, according to a new report, more than 71% of that spending goes to the illegal market due to various forms of cannabis prohibition enforced in 39 states. 
A new report using data from New Frontiers Data, U.S. Cannabis Report, notes that American illicit market encompasses roughly $60 billion in annual sales, which compares to around $23 billion in illegal medical and adult-use cannabis sales. State legal cannabis sales figures are often disputed as there is no government tally on the federally prohibited products. Leafly 2020 Jobs Report estimates the size of the legal American cannabis market at around $14 billion, or one-fourth of the illegal total. When it comes to states, Texas leads all non-legal use in its purchases. The report estimates that the Lone Star State accounts for 7% of all illegal cannabis sales in the United States, which is roughly $4.2 billion, or more than three times the size of Colorado's legal market. Oh, they're embarrassing my home state. Next on the list is North Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, and Indiana, which each account for roughly 3% of the nation's illegal sales. The illicit market is about 2.5 times the state legal market. As the data suggests, America is missing out on hundreds of thousands of legal jobs and billions of dollars in tax revenue, according to the same study. Now, I must admit, I think it's kind of funny that they're arguing that uh, the reason weed should be legal is because of taxes. (laughs) You know, ignore the whole freedom thing. It's all those beautiful taxes. Today's $14 to $23 billion legal cannabis market supports 243,000 Full-time American jobs, good gravy. Doing the math, a fully captured illicit market would add more than 600,000 full-time jobs to the national economy. Once again, in my opinion, the deciding fact of something being legal or illegal should not be dependent on how many jobs it would provide. (laughs) That just doesn't seem reasonable. At a relatively conservative 10% tax rate, capturing $60 billion in sales would yield $6 billion in cannabis tax revenue every single year. That's as much as New Hampshire's entire annual state budget. Well, isn't that fine? Fine and dandy. All right, let's see if I have another crime story. I do. A Canada Tesla driver is charged by napping while speeding. (laughs) Police say that both seats of the Tesla were fully reclined and the driver and passenger were apparently both asleep when they were alerted to the incident in Alberta, Canada. When the police turned on their emergency lights and other vehicles moved out of the way, the Tesla Model S sped up. The 20-year-old driver from British Columbia is due in court next December. He has initially been charged with speeding and handed a 24-hour license suspension for fatigue, but was subsequently charged with dangerous driving. The incident happened near Pononka. I don't know where that is, but it makes me sound smart when I say it. Quote, nobody was looking out the windshield to see where the car was going. According to the police sergeants on the scene, he said that when they put on their emergency lights, the Tesla accelerated with vehicles ahead of it moving out of the way. Quote, nobody appeared to be in the car, but the vehicle sped up because the line was clear in front. He went on to add, quote, I've been in policing for 23 years and the majority of that in traffic law enforcement and I am speechless. I never ever seen anything like this before, but of course the technology wasn't there. Now, of course, Tesla cars are not fully autonomous. They operate on a level two autopilot, which requires the driver to remain alert and ready to act with hands on the wheel. However, the Tesla founder, Elon Musk, has said repeatedly that he expects his vehicles to be completely autonomous with little driver input needed by the end of the year. However, he added that there were, quote, many small problems that would need solving through real-world testing. All right, next story. We're running a bit fast, so we are already past all of the crime stories, and now we are going to start off the basic weird news with space travel reality shows which plan to send contestants to the International Space Station. Following the success of SpaceX's Crew Dragon mission, which marked the return of the U.S.'s capability for manned flights and the first private company to get people into orbit, a reality TV series wants to send a civilian into space. Space Hero Incorporated is a U.S.-based production company founded by Thomas Ramir, and Deborah Sass, and led by former News Corp Europe Chief Marty Pompadour. (laughs) 
They have secured a seat on the 2023 mission to the International Space Station. It will go to a contestant chosen through an unscripted show title, which will be Space Hero, (laughs) which will be produced by Ben Silverman and Howard Owens. Their series will launch a global search for everyday people from any background who share a deep love for space exploration. They will be vying for the biggest prize ever awarded on TV, according to the producers. The selected group of contestants will undergo extensive training and face challenges testing their physical, mental, and emotional strength, qualities that are essential for an astronaut in space. The basic idea is for the culmination of the competition to be in an episode broadcast live around the world where viewers from different countries can vote for the contestant they want to see going to space. The show will then chronicle the winner's takeoff, their stay in the International Space Station for 10 days alongside professional astronauts traveling 1,700 miles per hour. That can't possibly be right. Yep, I just looked it up. It's 17,000 miles per hour, orbiting the Earth 16 times per day, and end with their return to Earth. The Space Hero Company is currently in discussions with NASA for a potential partnership for STEM initiatives on board the International Space Station. The trip of the Space Hero winner is expected to be on SpaceX Dragon rocket through a launch provider is yet to be officially selected. Space Hero Build as the first space media company is working with Axiom Space Manufacturer on the world's first privately funded commercial space station. A module for the International Space Station where the private astronauts can stay and full-service human spaceflight mission provider is commonplace. Led by Mike Cefadini, (laughs) who served as NASA's International Space Station program manager for 10 years, handles all aspects of the Space Hero private astronaut mission from brokering the trip to the International Space Station currently embarked for early 2023 and securing the rocket seat to training the aspiring astronauts and insurance coverage. That's brilliant. They blew their entire budget on sending astronauts to space and paying for insurance. (laughs) I like how we finally privatize space travel, and the first thing these people want to do is uh, film The Bachelorette in Space. (laughs) The series will be taken out soon with global streaming platforms and broadcast partner in each country, including the U.S., explored as distribution options. They aren't quite sure which country they want to use for their programming. It depends on which one gets the most views. Quote, We see the world changing in front of our eyes. In times like these, we yearn to look up to people for the right reasons. So it's time to look amongst ourselves to find the heroes that will inspire a bright future. That's according to the project's creator and founding partner, Mr. Ramir. However, this show was not just imagined in the past year or so. It actually can be traced all the way back to 2008. Back then, this Ramir fellow... Was uh, He was actually in the music business, and while he was working on a girl band global talent search reality show, he visited Moscow and met with Channel One CEO Konstantin Ernest. (laughs) Doesn't sound like a Russian last name, does it, Ernest? But uh, they brought up the idea for a reality series that would find, through a casting search, somebody who would be sent to the International Space Station. The two worked on the premise, which was ultimately shelved in the U.S. in 2009 when NASA announced the shutdown of the shuttle program, with the first flight taking place in 2011. Years later, Ramir and Sass, a seasoned entertainment tech industry executive, had teamed on a project together after getting to know each other over the work in the same area of music and tech convergence. Good God, that was boring. I'm sorry I read that all to you. Quote, When 2015 came, it became clear that there would be more than just one rocket company available. At that moment, it was only the Russians flying to the ISS, but in 2015, SpaceX, Boeing were gearing up to bring people back to the ISS from the United States as well. And so it became clear that there will be access capacity for those tickets I talked to Debs about it, and she said, quote, Why don't you bring the show back again? 
They can make a TV show about making this TV show, but I'm kind of exhausted with this story, so we're going to go ahead and go to a break. When we come back, we'll go through a few more weird news stories. Before we get to my top 10 unsolved mysteries, so stay tuned for all of that. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Weird News Podcast, where Chuck E. Cheese wants to send more than $2 million to destroy 7 billion prize tickets. Good God, my childhood is going up in flames. So for reference, 7 billion prize tickets is uh, is actually enough to fill approximately 65 40-foot cargo shipping containers. That's how many tickets they're looking to destroy. And uh, I know that sounds like a lot, but I still don't see why that should cost $2 million. Early this year, however, CEC Entertainment Incorporated, the owner of the pizza company, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And as a result, last Monday, the CEC Entertainment Inc. filed a motion in the United States Bankruptcy Court for the Southern District of Texas to destroy every single remaining ticket. The 7 billion tickets, which contain the company trademark, have already been printed, and Chuck E. Cheese wants them destroyed because the money it would cost to destroy the tickets is far cheaper than the $9 million that it would cost the pizza chain if the tickets ended up in the hands of the general public and were redeemed for prizes. How could it end up in the hands of the public unless you give it to the public, though? They should just buy a few acres of land and dump all the containers on there. Then throw up a slide in some monkey bars, add a sign that says Chuck E. Cheese National Park, and by God, you have a grave site for the great franchise. Chuck E. Cheese said that it has reached split settlements with three different companies to destroy the tickets. <laughs> they have so many prize tickets, they need three companies to destroy them. Eastern Trading LLC, Supply Chain Engineering, and Performance Food Group. Each of these companies is either as a manufacturer or a distributor of these tickets. And Chuck E. Cheese is now turning to e-tickets due to what it is saying the industry's rapid move towards contactless service due to COVID-19. And it notes that it will also eliminate future costs with the move. Quote, as a result of the unprecedented and rapid fall off in sales after resulting decline in the debtors, Use of the prize tickets caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the debtors' need for prize tickets dramatically diminished, causing buildup of prize tickets at various stages throughout the debtors' supply chain. These are very big words for the kind of people who follow Chuck E. Cheese. Throughout the distributors' supply chain, as the debtors had placed orders and planned for ticket prize utilization on historic run rates based on pre-COVID-19 levels. The company said in court documents, quote, This issue was further advanced as a result of the debtor's need to accelerate the implementation of electronic tickets, e-tickets, and discontinue use of paper-sized tickets at all company-owned Chuck E. Cheese entertainment venues. I like how they call it an entertainment venue as though it's a strip club or something. <laughs> Eastern Trading, PFG, and SCE reached separate agreements with the pizza maker for a combined $2,280,342.97 to destroy the tickets. While Chuck E. Cheese is discontinuing the use of paper tickets, it will continue to honor all tickets currently in circulation and held by customers as they are, quote, a valid currency in the Chuck E. Cheese empire. An emergency telephonic hearing will take place on the matter on Monday. 
Chuck E. Cheese has a location at the Union Square Shopping Center on Union Deposit Road in Squaresman Township, which will be the last remaining Chuck E. Cheese where you can cash your tickets at. Swell. Isn't that swell? All right, the next story. This is one of those stories that's not really the best story in the world, but the title alone makes it so I have to read it on this podcast. Quote, This Chinese cockroach farm houses a billion roaches kept contained by a moat filled with hungry fish. (laughs) Brilliant. For a final assignment to cap a five-year posting to China, correspondent Bill Bertels visited a cockroach farm surrounded by a moat. The man said, quote, I'm standing in the dark, sweating profusely as the rain-like sound of millions of cockroaches eating fills the silence. It's a peaceful ambiance that will go well on those calming sleep apps. Everything else about the situation would probably keep people awake, however. As around the walls, the ceiling, and the floors, cockroaches large and small scurry about, scattering whenever my cameraman Steve points his camera light at them, end quote. So this is said to be the largest roach nest. <laughs> As though that's something to uh, to praise. Four industrial-sized hangers packed with rows of the elaborate pipe systems that pump food waste collected from restaurants onto the shelves for the roaches to eat. The lights are off, the temperature is maintained in the high 20s, and humidity is stifling. That's 20 degrees Celsius, of course. We have 60 small rooms. This is according to the farm owners. We have 60 small rooms. There are 20 million cockroaches in each room. In total, there are about 1 billion cockroaches. And every day, they will eat 50 tons of kitchen waste. These farms are very popular in China. And while a massively large facility in southwest China, run by a company called Good Doctor, grinds up billions of roaches each year for use in Chinese medicine. These projects mainly use them for animal feed. Quote, if we farm cockroaches on a large scale, we can provide protein that benefits the entire ecological cycle. That is according to the head of the project, who goes on to say, quote, we can replace animal feed filled with antibiotics and instead supply organic feed, which is good for the animals and the ground soil. This started as an experiment to deal with food waste, which has blossomed into a commercial operation. Although the project lead admits that it's still early days and unclear if it will be profitable in the long term. But the sprawling fields around the cockroach farm already have pigs, ducks, chickens, and goats that are feeding on the nutrient-rich cockroach mix. More importantly, however, because it's funny, a moat around each hangar is filled with rapacious fish hooked on the taste of cockroach. It's kind of sad. All these cockroaches live crammed on an island, and they're surrounded by monstrous beasts that can eat them if they try to escape. Quote, They help to ensure the billion or so cockroaches inside don't break out and wreak havoc on the fields nearby. Now, this article actually continues, and they go into how cockroaches are not actually household pets, and that they're incredibly helpful for the ecosystem. But I do not care about that, so we're going to go ahead and skip all of it. If you want to go and Google that, you can. (laughs) Not sure if you want that on your search history or not. A quick follow-up on a story we had a while ago, the Tennessee tiger sightings. If you remember a few weeks ago, a bunch of people sighted a tiger in Tennessee several of which were cops, is uh, actually not a tiger at all. It was, in fact, a bobcat, which makes me incredibly upset. How could you not tell the difference between a tiger and a bobcat? I do not know. Quote, taking everything into consideration, the lack of new sightings and the conditions the first sighting was reported in, it seemed highly unlikely that there was a big non-native cat on the loose. So that's just a, uh, a quick follow up on a story we had a week or two ago of course it ends as everything ends in a disappointing way all right we have two more stories before i get to my top 10 unsolved mysteries let's knock these ones out the living coffin uses mushrooms to compost dead bodies beautiful my kind of story for tens of thousands of years humans have developed funeral rites and burial practices that reflected the attitudes of their particular time and place These traditions of honoring the dead continue to evolve into the 21st century as people seek, quote, green burials 
that are more environmentally friendly than standard coffins. I'm not sure why coffins are not environmentally friendly. I mean, they're made of wood, aren't they? I don't know, I'm probably just stupid. <laughs> One of the newest example comes from Loop, which is a Dutch biotech company that recently unveiled a biodegradable coffin made of fungus, microbes, and plant roots. Called the, quote, living cocoon, the coffin is designed to hasten body decomposition while also encroaching soil around the plot. I think they meant to say enriching soil around the plot, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> quote, normally what we do as humans is we take something out of nature. We kill it. We use it. So I thought, what if we humans start moving from working with dead materials towards a world in which we work with living materials. <laughs> I love this guy. And he goes on to say, quote, We would not only become less of a parasite, but we could also start exploring super cool material properties like living lights, walls which are self-healing, and that kind of stuff. <laughs> I make fun of him, but he's probably far more wealthy than I will ever be. Which, from his point of view, probably makes him more parasitic. Anyways, <laughs> this man was inspired to develop the living cocoon while presenting a living home concept at last year's Dutch Design Week. While houses are obviously for the living, the man got to thinking about attempting the concept into a coffin powered by mushroom mycelium, which is the filamentary vegetative part of the fungus, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Quote, mycelium is nature's biggest recycler. It is continuously looking for dead organic matter to transform into key nutrients. And uh, this, this is no small potatoes here. He developed this collaboration with Delft University of Technology and the Naturalist Biodiversity Center. The living cocoon actually contains a moss bed packed with mycelium plant roots and a lush ecosystem of micro organisms it is already on the market in the netherlands and has been used for a burial at the hangus which is a city on the north sea coast of western netherlands initial tests of the coffin indicate that it degrades in soil over about 30 to 45 days and the loop team estimates that bodies within coffins should decompose after three years Mushrooms can also remove contaminants from soil, so the researchers have a, quote, bigger vision to use coffins to purify dirty environments. They go on to say, quote, we have a dream of having super new natural funeral-based concepts in which we go to different cities and search for the most dirty soil and start cleaning that up with our graves. <laughs> he goes on to say, quote, We already have this product launched on the market, but what we want to really know is how long does decomposition take exactly? What does the decomposition phase look like? And also, this is super important, what kind of chemicals can it absorb and what amounts? Now, you see, none of that is interesting to me. However, I must say that the living cocoon is one of the many emerging concepts that aim to reduce the environmental tolls of current mortuary norms, according to this article. Now, uh, I really don't know what that means. <laughs> I wasn't aware that there was a grave environmental toll. Right now, according to this article, both caskets and cadavers are treated with chemicals that leach into soil over time, potentially contaminating groundwater. Green burials are not exactly a new phenomenon, as indigenous cultures around the world have practiced environmentally friendly mortuary practices for thousands of years. And then the example they use is hilarious. Quote, sky burials, which expose bodies to high altitudes where they can be scavenged by birds and animals, which are still practiced in Himalayas today. <laughs> that doesn't sound pleasant at all. But uh, in the words of the creator of this fungus grave, quote, I think people are ready for this. <laughs> I don't know what that means, and I don't think he does either. Either way, it's time to move on. We're going to do a last short story. A fifth grader told to remove Hooter's face mask in class, which uh, is coincidentally my last story and my Florida story of the week. A fifth grade student was told not to wear his face mask because it contained the Hooter's logo on it which violates the student code of conduct. 
The child, who is 11 years old, has said that he had been wearing the mask to class for the entire school season, which started at Sunset Park Elementary last August. Earlier this week, the principal told him it was, quote, inappropriate because it expresses a woman's body. The boy's father disagrees, quote, he's not thought that there is anything wrong with the mask, nor does he think there's anything wrong with the restaurant. <laughs> and so he called the principal and told him, quote, he told me it was deemed offensive. I told him we go there as a family. We eat their wings. We watch their sports. I said we have chocolate cake. We go there all the time. It is not an offensive mask. <laughs> I love this story. The child said, quote, I believe it was a counselor that came and she told me to take it off and that it was inappropriate. So I needed to take it off. He went on to say, I asked her if I was allowed to wear it inside out, and she said, yes, I could wear it inside out. I love this kid. He repeats everything. So I wore it like that the rest of Jim. However, the kid's father says that the child was actually upset by this order. Quote, he was afraid he was going to get reprimanded in trouble and perhaps suspended from school. Uh, yeah, I don't think any child's ever been upset by being suspended from school. Quote, I have never viewed it as anything but a restaurant. Do we feel women's bodies are offensive? I don't know. I don't. The principal told me that it was inappropriate. I said I don't understand why it's inappropriate. There's nothing wrong with that mask. <laughs> and he went on to say, quote, we do like the chicken wings. They have the best chicken wings. <laughs> And with that, I think we're going to go ahead and take a break. Stay tuned to the next segment where I will give you my top 10 unsolved mysteries. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the top 10 unsolved mysteries on the GSMC Weird News Podcast number 10. Starting out with my least favorite one, the Bermuda Triangle. The Bermuda Triangle is an area of water in the North Atlantic Ocean in which a large number of planes and boats have gone missing in mysterious circumstances. Over the years, many explanations have been put forward to the disappearances, including bad weather, alien abductions, time warps, and suspensions of the laws of physics. Although substantial documentation exists to show that many of the reports have been exaggerated, there is still no explanation for the unusually large number of disappearances in the area now. The important thing to note is that there is not <laughs> an unusually large number of disappearances in the area of the Bermuda Triangle, but I feel like that's largely common knowledge by now, so I'm going to leave it to you to look up the details for that. Number 9. The Tau's Hum. I like this one a lot. The Tau's Hum is a low-pitched sound heard in numerous places worldwide, specifically the USA, the UK, and Northern Europe. It is usually heard only in quiet environments, and is often described as sounding like a distant diesel engine. Since it has proven indetectable by microphones or VLF antennae, its source and nature is largely a mystery. In 1977, it was addressed by Congress, who directed scientists and observers from some of the most prestigious research institutes in the nation to look into a strange low-frequency noise heard by residents in and around the small town of Taos, New Mexico. For years, those who have heard the noise often describe them as a low hum and have been looking for answers. 
To this day, nobody knows the cause of the hum, and the town actually attracts many visitors who claim they hear the hum themselves. This drives many conspiracies, as is a theme in the Unsolved Mysteries category. But, of course, being that it's in New Mexico, a lot of theories are centralized around government testing of weaponry, which is kind of fun. I think one day we'll do a top 10 conspiracies based around U.S. government testing of weaponry. I think that would be fun. All right, number eight, the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer was an active serial killer in Northern California for 10 months in the late 1960s, and he killed at least five people and injured two. He committed the first two murders with a pistol just inside the Benicia border. In his second shooting in Vallejo, he attempted to kill two people, but one survived despite gunshots to the head and neck. Yeah, I remember that part of the movie. Forty minutes later, the police received an anonymous phone call from a man claiming to be their killer. He admitted to the murders of the previous two victims. One month, three letters were sent to newspapers in California containing a cipher that the killer claimed would give them his name. The cipher was decrypted to read, quote, I like killing people because it's so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all to kill. There are a lot of misspellings, so I'm going to actually read them like they're spelled. It goes on to say, quote, Something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is when they, when I will be reborn in paradise and I will have killed, will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to saw me down or atop my collage of slaves for my afterlife. Iberometamafapatipiti. <laughs> the last 18 letters have not been decrypted yet. However, the man Arthur Lay Allen is the prime suspect. All of the evidence was against him being the killer, unfortunately, and to this day the Zodiac murders have not been solved. And if you have a spare 18 hours, I suggest you go watch the film. It's excellent by the great David Fincher. Number 7, Black Delilah. This is one not so many people know about. In 1947, the body of 22-year-old Elizabeth Short was found in two pieces in a parking lot in Los Angeles. According to newspaper reports, shortly after the murder, Short received the nickname Black Delilah at a Long Beach drugstore in the summer of 1946 as a play on the then-current movie The Blue Delilah. However, Los Angeles County District Attorney investigators report states that the nickname was invented by newspaper reporters covering the murder up. In either case, Short was not generally known as the Black Delilah during her lifetime. Many rumors and tales have spread about the Black Delilah and the investigation. One of the largest in Los Angeles history has never found the... In 1947, a person claiming to be Short's killer placed a phone call to the office of James Richardson, the editor of the Examiner paper congratulating Richardson on the newspaper's coverage of the case and stated he planned on eventually turning himself in, but not before allowing the police to pursue him further. Additionally, the caller told Richardson to, quote, expect some souvenirs of Beth Short in the mail. And eventually, a mailman found the package and opened it before it could get to the news media and found Short's birth certificate, business cards, photographs, and names written on a piece of paper which all were traced back to Miss Short. However, the murder has still gone unsolved to this day. All right, number six, the Shroud of Turin. So the Shroud of Turin is a linen cloth bearing the image of a man who had apparently died of crucifixion, and most Catholics consider it to be the burial shroud of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It is currently held in the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist in Turin, Italy. Despite many scientific investigations, no one has yet been able to examine how the image was imprinted on the shroud. So you can go online and take a look at the shroud itself, and there's a face that uh, kind of looks like modern depictions of Jesus, which has been permanently imprinted on the shroud itself. 
and yet nobody has been able to explain how the image got there. Despite many attempts, no one has managed to replicate it either. Many radiocarbon tests actually date the image to the mid-ages. However, apologists for the shroud believe it is incorrupted, and carbon dating can only date things which decay. It is said that this cloth has been known since biblical times, and is a reportedly stated about in John 27, which states that it exists, which is said to have covered Christ's head in the tomb. A 1999 study by Mark Gushin, a member of the multidisciplinary investigation team of the Swedish Center of Sindiology, <laughs> That was quite the title. Investigated the relationship between the two cloths, and based on history, forensic pathology, blood chemistry, and stain patterns, he concluded that the two cloths covered the same head in two distinct but close moments of time. A researcher at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem concurred with this analysis, adding that the pollen grains in the Udarium match those of the shroud. The question is, is this a picture of Jesus Christ or not? Nobody really knows, and a lot of people don't really care. Number five, Comte de Saint Germain. So, uh, the Count of Saint Germain, <laughs> who allegedly died February 27, 1784, was a courtier, adventurer, inventor, and amateur scientist, violinist, amateur composer, and a mysterious gentleman who also displayed some skills with the practice of alchemy. He was known as Der Wonderman, which uh, means the Wonder Man. <laughs> he was a man whose origin was unknown and who disappeared without leaving a trace. Since his death, various occult organizations have adopted him as a model figure or even as a powerful deity. In recent years, several people have claimed to be the Count of Saint Germain. Note that the Saint Germain was never... Regarded as a saint by the Roman Catholic Church, in fact, he is not highly regarded in those circles. And his death still remains a mystery. If he died at all, maybe he kept himself alive forever using alchemy. You know, Xerxes style, Philosopher's Stone, equivalent exchange, all that nonsense. Alright, number four. Let's go with the babushka lady. So, during the analysis of the film footage of the assassination of JFK, that's John F. Kennedy... In the 1963, a mysterious woman was spotted. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, the evidence so far is pretty weak. She was wearing a brown overcoat and a scarf on her head. The scarf is the reason for her nickname as she wore it in a similar style to Russian grandmothers, also called babushkas. The woman appeared to be holding something in front of her face, which is believed to be a camera. She appears in many of the photos of the scene. Even after shooting... JFK, when most people had fled the area, she remained in place and continued to film. Shortly after she is seen moving away to the east up Elm Street, the FBI publicly requested that the woman come forward and give them a footage, which she shot, but she never came forward. In 1970, a woman called Beverly Oliver came forward and claimed to be the Babushka woman, though her story contains many inconsistencies. She is generally regarded as a fraud. To this day, nobody knows who the Babushka woman is or what she was doing there. More unusual is her refusal to come forward to offer the evidence, which could contain the answers to the open question of JFK's assassination. All right, number three, the Mary Caleste which was launched in Nova Scotia in 1860, whose original ship name was the Amazon, was a 103-foot overall displacing 280-ton ship who listed as a half-brig over the next 10 years as she was involved in several accidents at sea and passed through a number of owners. Eventually, she turned up at New York Salvage Auction where she was purchased for three grand. After extensive repairs, she was put under American registry and renamed Mary Calesti. The new captain of the Mary Calesti was Benjamin Briggs in 37, who was a master with three previous comrades. On November 7th, 1872, the ship departed New York with Captain Briggs, his wife, young daughter, and a crew of eight. The ship was loaded with 1,700 barrels of raw American alcohol bound for Genoa. The captain, his family, and the crew were never seen again, of course. 
The ship was found floating in the middle of the Strait of Gibraltar. There was no signs of a struggle on board, and all documents except the captain's log were missing. In early 1873, it was reported that two lifeboats grounded in Spain, one with a body and an American flag, and the other containing five bodies, and it has been alleged that these could have been the remains of the crew of the Mary Celeste. However, the bodies were apparently never identified. There are many suspicions as to what happened to the crew. Many believe that they went insane at sea. Many believe that they were attacked by pirates and the pirates had no use for such a crappy vessel. <laughs> I like that one. Another is that the crew thought the ship was sinking and so they left on lifeboats. And it turns out that the ship was not sinking at all and they couldn't get back on. Nevertheless, it remains an unsolved mystery. Number two. Jack the Ripper. In the later half of 1888, London was terrorized by a series of murders in the East End Widda Chapel area. The name Jack the Ripper was taken from a letter sent to a newspaper at the time by somebody claiming to be the killer. The victims were typically prostitutes who had their throats cut and bodies mutilated. In some cases, the bodies were discovered just minutes after the Ripper had left the scene. The police say at the time they had many suspects but could never find sufficient evidence to convict anyone. In modern times, there has been some speculation that Prince Albert Victor was the murderer. Even with modern police methods, nobody further pursues the case which has been shed on the murders in recent times. To this day, nobody knows who the Ripper was. Many people also believe that it was a man named William Gull. This is the one I like to believe because I read the comic book as a kid and I thought it was funny. <laughs> it should be noted that that is largely dismissed by scholars. But it's kind of interesting because William Gull was an actual physician. And the basic rumor goes that since he was basically a surgeon, he would be most adept to serial killing in the fashion that the prostitutes were murdered. Or he might have even trained the real Jack the Ripper. But we will likely never know. Number one. This is going to be a controversial pick. It's a personal pick, I'll admit. The Vinich Manuscript. So the Vinich Manuscript is a medieval document written in an unknown script and an unknown language. Basically, it is a book filled with its own writings that don't exist anywhere else. It looks like the text of a wizard from another planet. It's really cool. If you're a nerd like me, you can go online and actually look at pictures of it. Some of the art is really gorgeous and creepy at the same time. And for over 100 years, people have tried to break the code with, uh, with no success at all. <laughs> the overall impression given by the surviving leaves of the manuscript suggests that it was meant to serve as a pharmacopoeia, which is a book of medicine, or to address topics in medieval or early modern medicine. However, the puzzling details of illustrations have fueled many theories about the book's origins, the context of its text, and the purpose for which it was intended. The document contains illustrations that suggest the book is six parts, herbal, astronomical, biological, cosmological, pharmaceutical, and recipes. <laughs> Isn't that fun? What's really bizarre to me is that there's just entire chapters where it's seemingly random text with no flow whatsoever. So just a really cool unsolved mystery to me. All right, but that's going to wrap up the weird news of the day. I'd like to thank you for listening to the GSMC Weird News Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I also ask that you go and subscribe to us and leave us a review. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and I will ask that you come again tomorrow. Thank you. Have a good night.